The snow has subsided. The spring equinox is a thing of the recent past. The Canada geese have made their presence known, honking with great abandon. Nothing short of poetry. Right, we've got about two or three hours of daylight left, which isn't ideal by any means. But fuck it, it's not the worst speedrun I've ever done. It might be though if these. I don't know how impressive this is going to look on camera, but these grooves you can see in the bedrock, they were created at some point during the last ice age. They have a name which escapes me at the moment. No. Striations. Glacial striations. There we go. Got there in the end. They were created by debris like, uh, I don't know, rocks, sand, gravel, what have you, that was trapped underneath the ice. And when the ice started to melt and slide away, that debris got pulled along with it and essentially carved out these pretty deep grooves in this case. It's like a skid mark that transcends time. Here's a more aesthetically pleasing example of glacial striations, in my opinion. It's a bit like, a, I don't know, a vinyl record. It's a very smooth surface with some very shallow grooves in it. So I guess you could look at it as a vinyl record of natural history, if you really want to be that pretentious about it. Look at this little fucker who's been stalking me for the last five minutes. Look at him shaking his ass. This is the Coltsfoot Tosiligo farfara. Very common in the spring. Its primary identifying features are its shaggy, bright and yellow flower head, and its reddish brown and, uh, scaly. Stem. I feel like that's a good description. It gets its name from the shape of its leaves, which I can't seem to find anywhere at the moment, so I'll find a picture of them instead. In the year of our lord, the colt's foot is rarely seen as much more than a weed. But it wasn't always like that. Because this one is a medicinal plant, used in the past as an antitussive. Cough medicine. Although its use as an antitussive is what its scientific name is based on, it's really not recommended these days. Because it does contain a few compounds that have been confirmed to be mildly carcinogenic. But I'll try it nonetheless, just to see how much people had to suffer before cough syrup tasted like Jägermeister. That already looks fucking repulsive. But, let's give it a try. God damn it. Do not worry, for it is just a deer. A roe deer, to be exact. Capriolus capriolus. Cute, but they do make quite a fucking racket sometimes. And there's that shit done. I don't know what to expect, but... Ugh. It smells exactly the way it looks. Like depressed diarrhea. But, time to quit stalling and get her done. Here it goes.
and it tastes like ass. Am I surprised? Not really. That's the case with most things you find out here. They either taste like nothing or just taste really bad. I wouldn't say this tastes very bad, but it's it's unpleasant. Not recommended. Before the dandelions, before the coltsfoots, before the spring equinox even in some cases. These are the windflowers Anemonoides nemorosa, formerly of the genus Anemone. One of the first signs that winter is about to lose its grip and fade into spring. They're not really that interesting aside from their aesthetics when they carpet the forest floor between March and May. But they are fairly potently toxic. Anemonoides nemorosa owes its toxicity to the phytotoxin protoanemonin, which acts as a contact poison and a bit more traditional poison, in the sense that it can cause some pretty serious symptoms like hepatitis and paralysis if ingested. But let me get back to the contact poison part, because it's more interesting and testable. Protoanemonin is released whenever the plant is damaged, so let's do just that. Let's test this shit. Let's see what all the fuzz is about. So it's had plenty of time to roast in the sun at this point, but I can't really see anything except for the shit stain it left. It feels kind of sore, but that's about it. Uh, maybe there's an insinuation of a rash, but not really. It's kind of a rash trying to happen. It's been over an hour at this point. It's supposed to leave one, but apparently it doesn't leave one on me for some reason. I wouldn't really worry about the windflowers too much. Although it for some reason doesn't seem to do much of anything to me, that doesn't mean it won't do anything to anyone. When protoanemonin is applied to the skin like that, it can cause blistering and rashes. A bit like giant hogweed, except it's far less damaging. I'm only doing this because I'm self-destructive and I don't give a fuck. This elegant little plant goes by the name Paris Quadrifolia. Wait. For fuck's sake, that's disgusting. See, this asshole goes by the name Ixodus Ricinus. And for once, first time in history, it is at my fucking mercy. This bastard is responsible for the recent influx of diseases like Lyme disease and tick-borne encephalitis. This is what arachnophobes think all arachnids are like, and there's nothing good to say about it, so let's leave the premises. What a fucking loser. Looks like we got ourselves a crashed pilot. Conifers are by far the most common family of trees in the Northern Hemisphere. They're absolutely everywhere, and it can get pretty fucking monotonous, man. There are, however, a few different types of them, and they're often confused with one another because they are a bit nondescript. While that may be true on the surface, they're all quite identifiable by themselves. So let's take a closer look at the three conifer species I can see from here, which also happen to be the three most common ones. The Scots Pine is one of the two most abundant conifers. 
They come in a wide variety of different phenotypes, but they all have a few universally identifiable traits that place them within the species of Pinus sylvestris. Their most easily identifiable trait is probably their seed combs. Short, stumpy, and woody is probably the best way to describe them. They feel more like proper wood than mere shavings, as some other seed cones do. The bark can also sometimes be an identifying feature, but it can also vary greatly from specimen to specimen. However, pine trees, that is, older pine trees, tend to have this chunky, flaky, and porous bark that can be picked apart with relative ease to reveal a vivid reddish-brown interior. Like all conifers, the Scots pine is also defined by its needles. In the case of this species, the needles are about 4 cm long, they're relatively flexible, and they always grow in pairs. Here's the other most common conifer around these parts, the Norway spruce. They typically have a more uniform appearance than the Scots pine in that they tend to have a more conical shape. Like Christmas trees, cause that's exactly what they are. As they grow older, however, they take on a more generic shape. Just a grey stick with a Christmas tree on top. It's like a minimalist Christmas ornament. But that brings me to the bark. Compared to the bark of the Scots pine, the Norway spruce has relatively flat and uniform bark. It's brittle, like the pine bark, but it is flakier. The overall color is also more uniform. Where pine bark goes from a reddish brown to a greyish brown with age, the Norway spruce usually has greyish bark throughout its whole life. Their needles are about half the length of the pine needles, and they're arranged in a far more uniform pattern. This is what a spruce cone looks like. Like a big old shit. And this is where gin comes from. I mean, this is juniper. This one has short needles, similar to spruce needles, but they're arranged in a more chaotic, random, and sparse pattern than spruce needles. Like the pine trees, junipers also come in a variety of different shapes and sizes, but they all tend to be more on the bushy side, like this one. These also have seed cones, but they don't look anything like the pine and spruce cones. These look more like blueberries, and they are in fact simply called juniper berries in the common vernacular. They are indeed what the aforementioned gin is flavored with. The juniper berries are often used as a condiment, but it should be used sparingly because large doses have a potential to cause kidney damage and induce abortions in pregnant women. Most conifers are very different from each other once you get up close and personal with them, but one thing they all have in common, well, one thing the three I've just talked about have in common is that they are all loaded with vitamin C. Telling them apart is not a problem if you're aware of some of their identifying traits. If it has long needles and short cones, it's a Scots pine. If it has short needles and long flaky cones, it's a Norway spruce. And if it has short needles and blueberry-like cones, it's a juniper. It should also be noted that conifers like the Norway spruce and the Scots pine are climax species. What that means is that an ecosystem that is dominated by these species has reached the peak of its development, its climax phase. In the case of these particular species, that also means the local ecosystem has been left to develop freely for at least 50 years. There's, uh, something going on over there. I can't tell what it is. It doesn't look like the camera is picking it up either. Sounds like a dentist drill. That doesn't sound like the beginning of a cheap slasher movie at all.
This is fine. I'm tired of living anyway. Fucking come at me. You turn away for five seconds and the cloud's over. The challenge accepted. Cantharella Siberius. Keeping up appearances. Further enforcing the point that mushrooms aren't strictly an autumnal thing. Just gotta liberate these before someone else notices. Practice some scorched earth. If mid-2000's teen angst was a fungus, its name would be Xylaria hypoxylon. Or maybe even hypocylon. Bit of an etymological reason for that. They really do look like something you'd see in the Shivering Isles, don't they? They may have a dark and edgy aesthetic now, but they don't always look like this. Earlier in the season, they'd be covered by a pale bluish or greenish gray layer of asexual spores. I unfortunately didn't get here in time to see that, but up close you can still see the remnants of this spore layer. The name Xylaria hypoxylon is an example of a scientific name that is derived from Greek. Both of its names refer to some variation of the Greek word for wood, which is appropriate because this is a saprotrophic species that grows on wood, usually but not limited to dead hardwood. They're not toxic to humans, but they're not considered edible. Their texture is so tough and rubbery that chewing them is a bit of a fucking workout in itself. And that goes for all Xylaria species, of which I am personally aware. When you've spent hours looking for a plant that is usually very common in 80% humidity and 27 degrees in the shade, your motivation kind of starts to crawl after a while. Got it. The humble blueberry. Nothing special. Everyone knows these. Vitamins, antioxidants, common knowledge, right? But I'm not here to talk about that. Because did you know the anthocyanins found in blueberries and red cabbage can be used as a pH indicator? Allow me to demonstrate. Just because we're not gonna sacrifice any of our precious blueberries for this bullshit, here we have a pipette filled with the water recovered from a pot of boiled red cabbage. And here we have an assortment of various common acids and bases, along with their respective pH values. It starts off with hydrochloric acid, a pH zero, goes through acetic acid in the form of common household vinegar, water, ammonium hydroxide, and ends up at sodium hydroxide with a pH value of 14. This is not a good way of getting an exact pH value, and it's really only reliable for telling whether a substance is acidic, neutral, or alkaline. Acids tend to be on the red or pink side, neutral compounds like water and ethanol are usually purple, and bases tend to yield a blue or green solution.
There's supposed to be a path here somewhere, but now there are nettles. Millions and billions of nettles. Well, what are you gonna do, right? <laughs>